Welcome, everyone, to Community Central Tech Tuesdays. Um, this new series from the Red Hat Open Source Practice Office uh, will introduce you to a number of technologies um, that are in development in our communities um, or recently released um, that will show you what we are doing in cloud and elsewhere. Um, I, as part of the Tech Tuesday message, these talks will be demo-centric, and to get this kicked off um, to an exciting start, uh, we have Jonathan Katz, who is the director of All Things Cloud at leading PostgreSQL vendor Crunchy Data. Um, and Jonathan is going to show off the new PostgreSQL operator um, that uh, they've recently released. When did you release that? The 4.2 was released uh, at the end of December. Um, December, The yeah. latest, yeah. Okay. Um, as always with Community Central things, um, we will take questions at the end of the presentation and demo. Um, so if you do have a question, please post it in that Q&A pane in your browser, um, and we will start taking questions when Jonathan is done with his initial presentation. But in the meantime, Jonathan, take it away. Hey, thank you, Josh. Thanks for the, the nice introduction. I'm you know, very happy to be here. So uh, as uh, Josh said, my name is Jonathan Katz, and today we're going to talk about high availability Postgres on Kubernetes. Uh, just real quick, uh, you know, the standard boilerplate I like to give, uh, I work at a company called Crunchy Data. Uh, all we do is Postgres, and even better, all we do is open source Postgres. Uh, you know, we believe Postgres itself is an enterprise database. Um, and we try to do things to ensure you can deploy it successfully in your enterprise, be it, you know, on you know Kubernetes or ensuring you can meet all your various security requirements or just making sure that uh, you can deploy, post, uh, deploy Postgres durably. And standard boilerplate about myself, um, I've been using Postgres for a very long time. I'm very active in the open source community. Actually, that's how I know Josh. Um, I like, you know, my favorite part about uh, working with Postgres is actually helping out with the releases. And you know, we're actually starting to get the, the Postgres 13 release process underway. Um, so let's just hop right into it. What does it take to run a database in the enterprise? And, you know, before we go into the demo today, basically, you know, the, the way that I like to structure this talk is, you know, talk about like, what do you need for the quote day two operations? How you can get that from Postgres, how you can get that from Postgres on Kubernetes, and then uh, we will look at a demo. So when you look at what it takes to run, you know, Postgres in a production environment, there's, you can really bucket, you know, or in any database for that matter, you can really bucket into five things that you need to be able to provision it. You need to be able to create it, destroy it, you know, configure it, administrate everything under the sun there. You need high availability. You want to make sure that your uptime is maximized, that you can always access your data. And with databases, this presents, you know, some challenges that are different than, you know, running, you know, a, a web process. Uh, disaster recovery, you know, stuff goes wrong, someone drops the user table, uh, you know, a file gets corrupted, you want to be able to restore your database and, you know, be able to, you know, continue, you know, your regular, you know, business activities. Uh, monitoring, you need to be able to, you want to be able to take health checks, you want to be able to anticipate problems before they happen, so that way they don't become a disaster. And of course, authentication, you know, who can access your data, what can access your data, can you, you know, appropriately, you know, manage the users interfacing with your environment, and, you know, some other things that, you know, might be specific to your database system. You know, we're using the, we're saying this in the context of Postgres, but really this could apply to, uh, you know, any, any database management system. So let's bring Postgres into the containers world. Because, you know, I mean, that's really the, the context of the talk today. But first off, you know, why Postgres? I mean, Postgres has experienced a very big rise, you know, over the past several years, you know, which I'm, which I'm, of course, personally, I'm very happy about. But it's for, you know, to summarize this slide, it's really, you know, for a few things. One, Postgres has a long development history that, you know, features have been added to it really for the past 30 years. I mean, Postgres has been open source for over 20 years. You know, it's open source like Linux. You know, there's no no one company owns it. It's, you know, a very flexible license. And the feature set is really at parity with what you see with a lot of the proprietary databases out there. Along in fact, with uh, Postgres historic, you know, history of being very extensible and being able to accommodate, you know, things that help, you know, developers add features to it. So you take this and you take, you know, everything that's happening with, you know, running applications with containers that, you know, we can basically leverage containers to provide a lot of advantages to deploying Postgres. 
One of my favorites really is separating out what I, you know, the quote day two applications, like monitoring administration. Like for me, when I, when I was running Postgres and clusters myself, I always found those the biggest pain to administrate. But having those in isolated units that can run alongside Postgres offers a lot of advantages for administrating them independently from my Postgres cluster. But it also makes it easier to patch and distribute Postgres and keep things portable across, you know, you know, Kubernetes, OpenShift, or, you know, and the like frameworks. And that's, that is one of the biggest advantages because if you combine all these things together, you know, you can truly automate, you know, the provisioning, the scaling, you know, adding things, you know, like table spaces to, you know, Postgres, basically the multi-step operations, you know, you can fully, you can fully script out in a way that's consistent and portable. If you want to get started playing around with some of these services, uh, there is the open source Crunchy Container Suite, which has you know a lot of the things that you know required you know, not to just get Postgres up and running, but you know some you know some other things. You know, for instance, PG Admin 4, which provides a user interface you know around managing Postgres. So I invite you to check that out. But we're going to start talking about scale. We're going to just jump right into it. So Kubernetes, you know, one, the great thing about Kubernetes is that it is this orchestration platform that can let you, you know, manage thousands and thousands and thousands upon of services. And, you know, and really, you know, the brilliance of Kubernetes is that it has that unified layer that, you know, it doesn't matter where you deploy your Kubernetes cluster, you have that single API for managing your infrastructure. And that's really powerful. So we definitely would want, you know, we definitely want to use, leverage Kubernetes for, you know, managing Postgres. But it get you know because in theory we could run our own you know open source database as a service you know with Kubernetes for Postgres which is you know truly very powerful because it's open source managing open source and giving you you know some flexible ability to to run an elastic workload but th there is a catch here you know, Kubernetes you know was originally designed for managing stateless workloads you know I can bring a web server up it does some work I bring it down you know all is well but for Postgres if you bring it down, it still needs to maintain state that, you know, if you save data, that data needs to be there. And when you, you know, bring the process back up, you still need to be able to, you know, restore that data or access that data even. You know, what also makes this interesting too is that, you know, different stateful service behave differently. You know, Postgres, the way it stores and interacts with data is different than other database systems out there. So in order to maintain and manage stateful workloads properly, you do need additional knowledge. And this is where you can codify it, you know, using something like an operator. You know, the, the operator pattern basically, you know, is a way to reactively make changes to managing your stateful workloads and be able to capture the specific knowledge that you need for, uh, you know, maintaining those workloads, you know, you know, no matter what that system is. It also gives you the advantage of being able to automate these things as well and, you know, even take something that might be a simple operation and, you know, make it, you know, much easier to manage across, say, you know, a thousand Postgres clusters. This also allows us to encode, you know, the specific management things that are trickier and, you know, vary from system to system, you know, such as high availability, ensuring that you're taking regular backups, doing them efficiently, and so on and so forth. And, you know, the, and this also brings a lot of things too. And I actually, you know, the, the one that, you know, I think automation might be fairly obvious in this, you know, in terms of, you know, what you can do with Kubernetes, but it's the standardization that's very powerful because first off, it's, you know, it's that unified API, you know, basically for what, you know, for what Kubernetes does for, you know, your general workloads, operators do for your specific stateful workloads. They provide a consistent API across the board, but also it allows you to run your customizations. You know, Every Postgres workload is different. You might need to tweak, you know, the memory settings or the, you know, the CPU utilization or, you know, other things in the configuration file. But if you, if you have a unified way of accessing it, it makes it much easier for your team to, you know, interface and, you know, scale up and scale down your Postgres workloads and do, you know, whatever you need to do. Now, there's a few other things here as well that, you know, as you go down the list that, you know, make it, you know, that are advantages as well. But, you know, really I love to like focus on the standardization because I think that's the most powerful bit of the operator. So let's talk about the Crunchy Postgres operator. You know, this is why we're here today. So um, it's actually, we've actually been developing it for over three years now, actually. Happy happy uh, GA birthday to the operator. Um, the current version is 4.2.2. It's on operatorhub.io. Uh, it's recognized with, you know, level five autopilot capabilities, and that's really due a lot to how the high availability self-healing setup. 
you know, much like that first slide, you know, it, it handles all the, you know, all the features required, you know, for running a uh, enterprise, you know, enterprise database workload, you know, everything that you expect for the, the quote day two operations. You know, the overall architecture is, you know, what you would expect if you're familiar with the operator patterns that, you know, there's a set of CRDs um, that, you know, maintain the core definition of what it takes to run a Postgres cluster. And for convenience, there are uh, other ways to interface with it, including an API server, uh, several command line clients, and um, you know, we actually, you know, we actually have, you know, you know, a user interface to interface with it as well. In terms of the high availability architecture, and this is this is one of my favorite bits of it, is that you know the the crunchy Postgres operator is designed to be as good as your Kubernetes high availability. So what does that mean? Um, the way the distributed consensus is handled with the operator is that it uses the Kubernetes back DCS uh, distributed consensus store to basically determine, you know, you know, which of my, you know, the health of my Postgres clusters, which ones are up or is one, you know, unavailable due to, due to a network split or, you know, some other, some other downtime event. And, you know, using, using a distributed consensus protocol determines, okay, well, you know, we need to fail over. Let me promote the one, you know, let me promote the replica that's the furthest ahead that's available to ensure that, you know, we can one, minimize downtime, two, minimize, you know, how long it takes to catch up on the transactions and so on and so forth. So this is really powerful too, because you actually only need a primary and a replica to run a, uh, to actually have a uh, highly available Postgres cluster, in, you know, in, in Kubernetes. But, you know, of course, you know, it's better to have at least two replicas. The other thing, and this gets into that autom automation bit, is that we can set up this type of cluster with a single command. Uh, you know, the command below, which basically deploys, you know, a metric sidecar and, um, you know, a connection pooler, um, and as well as, you know, being able to push backups both to a, a local uh, you know, backup disk as well as a as well as to S3 on our S3 compatible storage. So I uh, promised 10 minutes of talking. I think I did 12. So let's get to the demo. All right, so I'm gonna pull up my screen. Um, I've already deployed the operator. Um, you know, that was the prerequisite to this. As you see, you know, if I access the command line, um, I have my command line tools and a lot of different ways of, uh, or a lot of different commands which we'll talk about in a minute, but let me chat a little bit less and let me create a cluster. So what I did here was I created a new Postgres cluster. Its name is Hippo. Um, I'm, we're going to add two replicas to it, and we're also going to deploy a PG Balancer connection pooler. So let me, I'm going to, I also wrote an application. Um, I probably should show you the code to it. Um, let me, of course, go to the screen. But basically, we're going to be recording some sensor data and then inserting into it, and we're going to see, you know, how it progresses. So first, we, we might want to check if our cluster is up. Probably is not at this point, but I could be surprised. Oh, it's up. Cool. So anyway, if we look at the pods that are available as well, we can see that uh, so far we've deployed our cluster. Uh, we deployed our uh, backup repo, which is very important both for uh, provisioning uh, replicas as well as the healing process. We deployed the PG Bouncer, which is what we're going to connect to. So I'm starting a port forward to that. Starting my application. And all right, you know, we're recording things. They're being saved to the database. You know, life seems good. Um, Let's test. All right, we're still provisioning the replicas. So we'll wait on that a minute. You know, just to show, go over some of the commands. Um, you know, you have a lot of commands that, you know, you would expect that you're able to scale up, you're able to scale down, you can you know, perform backups, you can perform restores, you can create schedules, actually. So when I say create schedules, you can basically create, um, you know, you can basically, uh, you know, schedule backups. Like I want a full backup to run once a day and incremental backups to run, uh, you know, once every six hours. Um, you can, you know, and, you know, there's also, you know, other other commands as well, as you can see. I encourage you to read the documentation to check them all out. All right, everything appears to be up. One other command I'd like to show off is the df command, which, um, no, it's not test, it's hippo which shows you your overall disk utilization. So, you know, so far we, we're not using very much because, you know, we just started adding data to our cluster. Let's see, where are we up to? So let's actually see what's going on inside the cluster, just for real quick. Make sure this is an on illusion. So 
let's see what our primary is called this connecting to it and I have my cheetah SQL so I became uh, the you know the the main the main user of the database just to go in as we see you know we're saving data I am also I'm keeping the recorded at time and the saved at time because we're going to see what happens with that in a second and yeah everything seems healthy and just for just for fun let's try to go to one of the replicas to prove there's nothing on my sleeve. So let's say I try to create a table in one of the replicas. Oh, it's definitely a replica. This is this is the message Postgres will will tell you if you're in a in a replica. All right. So everything seems good. Everything seems healthy. Everything is up. Let us see what we should do. Um. I think it's time to take it down. Let's see some, let's see high availability in action. So, get pods. Let's just delete the primary. There's many ways to trigger a downtime event. I'm gonna choose the good old fashioned. I decide that I'm gonna delete my primary. So let's see what happens to our uh, application. So I did put some connection retry logic um, in my application and it's trying to connect. There we go. We connected. Um, there's been a new primary elected. That's the cluster. So as we can see that, you know, this cluster, um, this uh, this pod uh, became elected the primary, and now we're currently healing the old primary. Let's see what happens. We go into the uh, the new primary. Oh, no, I want to do this. And let me get my cheetah SQL. You can see that, okay, the new primary is taking, um, is accepting new transactions. And we can see that we didn't lose a transaction. All the IDs that we've inserted are in order. We can see that there was a little bit of a delay. Um, that's, you know, that was during the promotion period, um, but we were able to successfully record it. And yeah, that's pretty good. So let's see if the new, the, the old primary came back up now. It did. Now let's see if it has all the proper data. Okay, let me get my cheat SQL. Yep, appears everything is there, including you know, where we went down, it was around here. So, yep, it fully healed. It's accepting new transactions. And to show there's nothing up my sleeve, try creating a new table. Um, yep, it is a replica. One other fun thing that we can do, you know, just to show off one more feature of the, the operator is we can clone clusters. So let me try cloning it. So this does take a few moments, but basically what happens is we lever we're leveraging an open source back of a restore utility called PG Backrest, um, which is designed you know, for you know, essentially databases that are you know, multi-terabyte size. Um, and because of how it works, what we do is that we're able to uh, copy the PG Backrest repo of, um, let's call it the, the Hippo cluster, um, and sync it over into the Rhino cluster because everything written to the PG Backus repo occurs in atomic transactions. So from there, uh, we're able to, you know, restore uh, a new Postgres cluster, um, you know, safely for that. So let's see how we're doing in terms of that. Oh, we're not up yet. What are we doing? Um, all right. Here we go. Okay, so all right, so we're getting there. Um, this is really cool because you know now you know now we can clone a cluster, and you know let's say I want to debug the data, I want to do further inspections on the data. Let's say you know after this failover event, I'm able to clone it and um, do that, and I don't affect the production data set. It's, it's taking a few moments to boot up. Let me see if I had anything else planned for the demo. Um, oh, so another another thing we can do. 
uh, just to show off some features coming up in you know the next release is you know we can you know add additional resources to um, you know our current cluster. So for instance, I want you know our workload is growing in size. I want to add more memory, and I know that I need you know I might want to add a table space you know which is useful for. Um, so depending on your workload, you might want to offload, let's say, you know, time series data to a particular table space, or you know, a particular data sets could be very large and you want it to be on its own disk. Uh, the Postgres operator allows you to manage all of that. So while I'm doing multiple things with the operator, which is what it's good for, uh, let's make sure that uh, the Rhino cluster is good, which I believe it is. Um, Yep, let me and let me find my SQL. Yep, and it cloned the data over. And you know, basically, you know, at the final point, it was able to get uh, the wall transaction from uh, the Hippo clusters. We you know when it started doing, but you know, it's acting independently of, as you can tell, the Hippo cluster, which is still entering data. Meanwhile, see how our other cluster is doing after adding the resources. A good way to check is with uh, the df command. Yep, there you go. The table spaces were added. And if we were to inspect one of the pods, uh, let's do a hippo. We look at the available resources, which of course took me a moment to find. There we go. See, we have the additional we have the additional memory there. Great. That is the demo. So for a quick demo recap, um, we basically saw the various options that uh, are available from the command line interface. Uh, we created a cluster. We went through the full life cycle of it. Uh, we caused some chaos. Uh, we saw it uh, fail over a heal. Uh, we cloned a cluster. We did some uh, resource resizing, and I think overall we had a good time. At least I had a good time. I hope you did as well. So quickly on our roadmap, you know, I always like to talk about what's coming up. Um, you know, Josh mentioned that the 4.2 release came out in December. We're actually already about to do our next release, you know, which we're targeting for April. Um, it's now, it's actually in beta. Uh, we've added improved, you know, hybrid cloud support. So we made it possible to run, you know, a primary Postgres cluster in one Kubernetes cluster and then have a replica cluster available in another Kubernetes cluster. So basically, you can run this across data centers. So this is, you know, this is, you know, let's call it quote operator federation. You can actually run you now multiple Postgres operators across Kubernetes clusters, and you know, essentially have one be a standby cluster. Uh, very powerful for, uh, you know, business continuity, disaster recovery, and so on and so forth. Um, I showed off uh, the support for Postgres table spaces. Um, we're improving the ability to customize your Postgres clusters. Uh, we now support, you know, you know, very easy, a very easy way to configure a Postgres TLS capability. So if you're running this in the public cloud, it's, you know, it's very easy to secure uh, your connections. Uh, improved support for PG Bouncer, uh, improved, you know, Postgres user management functionality, and actually we'll make it easier to install and upgrade as well. So coming in April 2020, um, and we're looking forward to getting it, you know, in your hands as soon as possible. So. Conclusion of this is that you know it's not only useful to run Postgres in containers. Um, there's actually many advantages as well when coupled with proper automation. For instance, that table space thing I showed you is you know kind of a pain if you know if you don't have it properly automated in the cloud. But you know with you know a couple keystrokes it becomes very easy. Simulate with high availability. Um, you know being able to orchestrate that and make sure. I mean it's really to make sure the Postgres clusters are you know aware that you know this is what they need to do in order to maintain availability. But being able to do that in containers, you know, it just that just makes it, you know, so much easier to deploy Postgres, you know, in the cloud, particularly knowing, you know, you know, every everything that can go wrong, you know, when you're running uh, cloud workloads. So um, basically, this is your own open source database as a service, and for me, it makes me so happy just having, you know, you know, contributed to open source for many years that, you know, we can, you know, leverage, you know, the power of Kubernetes and Postgres to let you, you know, run your own elastic workloads. So with that, I say thank you, and I am ready for questions. Okay, I want to stop sharing your screen there. Yes. Awesome. Yeah, you can see my kitchen. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yeah, your your no, it's your work from home office. The um. Yes. Well, the, like the rest of us. 
So our first question was actually about multi-data center replication. So um, that is, what would be the recommendations for maintaining high availability across multiple data centers? Um, would you say then that your recommendation would be to use the 4.3 beta? Um, yes. Uh, yeah. Yes. You you can you can jury rig this a bit with 4.2. Um, and basically the way the way that we leverage is with PG backrest and support for S3. So basically we push backups and wall archives to S3. And then if you have a Postgres cluster running in another data center, you can, you know, it's reading those in. Um, you know, of course, you know, we anticipate to being able to do more direct to direct connections, you know, leveraging the features within Kubernetes, you know, looking at, you know, what's coming up in, you know, KubeFed. Um, you know, part of that is we've been waiting for that to develop, but this gives you a way to get that sooner. Okay. Um, our second question there is, is synchronous uh, replication for Postgres supported? Um, yes. And for that matter, um, I'll add a note of my own. Uh, what about Quorum uh, synchronous? Ah, the, the famous Quorum. So, uh, yeah, so 4.2 introduced the support for uh, synchronous replication support. Um, Quorum, we are, you know, we, we don't have Quorum just yet. You could probably configure it. Um, I would say caveat emptor on that. Um, we are, you know, we're leveraging the open source Petroni library for uh, managing uh, high availability. Um, I believe there's been a patch open for Quorum commit for some time. And um, once that is in, I can tell you that will be, that will rise to the top of, you know, our ticket list for getting it in. A big fan of the Quorum commit feature in general. I think one of the understated features of Postgres 10. <clears throat> okay. Um, can you provide some more detail around the database backup architecture um, of the of the operator? Particularly, is a separate uh, a persistent volume for backups required? Um, yes. And are there <laughs> ways to back up off of the Kubernetes cluster? Yes. So the, the answer is yes to both of them. So. First, I actually I do invite you to read the documentation uh, for the operator. We actually go into depth about the various architectures with uh, diagrams. Um, I will try to now do an interpretive dance of the diagrams. So, um, so the way that the backup architecture works is that we the operator allows you to back up either to a PVC, um, and yes, it's a separate PVC for a lot of different reasons, uh, to an S3 to an S3 bucket or S3 compatible bucket or both. Um, and actually, the both is a very popular feature because then you know you're having your archives and backups pushed to two, two separate areas. Um, so um, next part of the question. So part so part of the architecture is well is you know to back up to other sources. You know besides from doing S3, it's you know wherever you know however you're leveraging your persistent volume. So if your persistent volume connected to an external storage system and then bind a PVC to that, um, then you're getting your backups to go to that uh, persistent volume. Okay. Um, <clears throat> another question here from Sergey, which is, um, is there any danger because of Kubernetes' limited ability to uh, fence storage? Is there any danger of multiple Postgres instances trying to access the same PV at the same time? So, I mean, so basically it's one PVC to one PV. So it really depends on your storage provisioner. I mean, what the operator does is that it delegates storage to the storage provisioner that you're using. It basically says, I need a PVC, and then it gets a P, you know, Kubernetes gives it a PVC. It says, cool, I'm going to trust that what you gave me is something that I can use. So it's, you know, it's really you're saying, do you trust uh, the storage provisioner that you're using? Pressure. Did you? Okay. Um, <clears throat> hmm. So I got Yanev's question, but I'm not quite sure I understand it. Uh, his question was, how do we handle, apart from active passive or active active instances, situation when a node is not responding in a kernel panic, for example? Um, it just works. So, I mean, it, it's, you know, it's essentially distributed consensus. The leader doesn't check in. And then the other, you know, the other Postgres instances are like, oh, no, the leader's not checking in. Like, let's, you know, we might need to hold an election. And based upon the outcome of the election, uh, a replica might get promoted to be the new leader. Okay. Um, so, okay, I think we got time for two more questions, so we'll take those two more. Cool. Um, okay. One is, I uh, what happens to in-flight user transactions during a failure um, and reschedule? Okay. Well, uh, we had demonstrated that in the demo. Uh, so what happens is that um, 
they can fail. If they haven't committed yet, they can fail, and then you'll have to retry them. If you're really sensitive to you know losing rights, then you want to deploy. You basically you want to deploy a synchronous replication, which basically will say like you know if I can't even you know try to write, like forget it, like I'm out. We're going to wait until the system is uh, back up. Now that in itself can create its own downtime, um, and of course you need to code your application or, you know around that. We are looking at some things to make it a little bit easier to uh, be able to deal with said scenarios as well. So there's less onus on the application development, but in general, you should be running your applications to deal with connection failures, you know, regardless of what system you use. Cool. Okay, and last question. Um, is the operator compatible with auto-scaling? Um, either, so, either the built-in Kubernetes auto-scaling or some other kind of auto-scaling. Yeah, so actually we did some testing with that around the 4.2 release, and so far, you know, it seemed to work. Um, so in this case, this is auto-scaling of nodes. Um, yes, yeah, so it, you know, our testing with auto-scaling of nodes does work. Now, there's then there's auto-scaling of storage, which is like a whole separate topic, which, you know, if Josh is willing to have me back after this, I'm sure we could do a whole 30-minute session just on storage management. So... Uh, we are actually looking into how to deal with that in some subsequent releases. Actually, part of part of part of managing that, is, you know, in the short term, is uh, you know the table space support that's about to come out and cloning okay. as well. Cool. So I think we're at time for this session. Um, thank you very much. If we didn't get to your question, um, I I'm sorry about that. Um, where's a good place for people to go if they have additional questions about the Postgres operator? Yeah, so uh, that is a good question. Uh, if you want, you can go to the, the repo, uh, open up a uh, issue. If you have a question, if you want to better understand how something works, uh, I will do my best to answer them, or someone on the team will try to do their best to answer it. Um, you can email me on the email address that's provided. Um, we probably should start some sort of mailing list. Uh, so, uh, you know, maybe that will be coming out soon. Okay. Well, thank you very much, um, the, um, and thanks, everyone, for attending. Um, I, <clears throat> as follow-up, uh, we will soon have a blog post detailing how to reproduce parts of the demo on your own, um, the, um, and that will actually go on the Community Central Tech Tuesday schedule, um, so if you want to check back there as well as um, we will be posting on the schedule next week's Tech Tuesday session, um, which is tentatively scheduled um, as uh, Quay developer Joey Shore talking about uh, the principles around container registries. Um, look for confirmation and a link for that within the next day. Um, and thanks, everyone, for attending. Thank you. Thank you for having me, Josh. Thank you for organizing it as well. <laughs>